revisiting the foundation of our faith. Now we say, what does it mean when we talk about visiting, you know, what does it talk, uh, mean when we talk about revisiting the foundation of our faith? What are we talking about? We're talking about number one. We want to take a closer look at what it means for what, we, what do you believe, what we believe. You call yourself a Christian. We call ourselves Christian. We gather here as a, as a body of Christ. What do we really believe? That's what we're talking about. Number two, we want to find out why we believe what we believe. In other words, what is the reasoning behind the idea where we come together and we sit and we say that we believe in the Almighty God? What is it? Why do we believe what we believe? Number three, we are studying the foundation. We are revisiting the foundation of our faith because we want to know what we believe about the God that we believe. In other words, do we believe him to be a merciful God? Or do we believe him to be a God who is just very wicked and is just on the lookout to knock you down? What do you believe about the God that you are serving? Number, you know, these are the questions. These are, this is why we are revisiting the foundation of our faith. And we said that the reason we are doing this is very simple. Number one, if you do not know what you believe, you are going to drift about in life. In other words, if you don't know what you believe as an individual, if somebody tells you something about God, you will believe that person. If somebody comes around and tells you another story, you will believe that person. You are going to drift about in life. That is why you want to know the foundation of your faith. Number two, why are we doing it? We are doing it because if you do not know why you believe in the Almighty God, if you don't know why you are in church, you will find out that you will have no anchor and your faith will be easily overturned. In other words, anybody can tell you any story and you are going to get out of faith. Anybody can tell you whatever they want to tell you and you, if you don't know the reason why you are doing what you are doing, you will easily change your mind. That is why we are talking about this. Number three, we are talking about this because if you don't know what you believe about the God that you are serving, if you don't know what you believe about the faith that you hold, it will be very easy for you to be deceived. Very easy. Because if I tell you something about God that you don't know about, it will be very easy for you to deceive. That's why people are very de people are being deceived all over the world. That is why people can say, oh, if you give a million dollars tomorrow, you have an express ticket to go to heaven. Because people don't know what they believe about who they believe. So the idea that is one of the those are the reasons we that, those are the reasons why we're looking or revisiting the foundation of our faith. And that's why in our very first installment of our study, we talked about what do Christians believe. We went into details to understand what Christians believe. In our second installment, we talked about why we believe what we believe. Number two, and then last week, we talked about who do Christians really believe? Who is this God that the Christians call their God? Who is this God that they worship? Who is this Jesus that they, that they, that they love and they revere? Why? You know, that is what we talked about last week. And today we are going a step further and we are talking about what does Christianity require of you? What does Christianity require of me? In other words, the way you are sitting down here, what is the Lord asking from you? What is the Lord asking from me? If I want to associate with the Almighty God, what does the Lord want from me? What does he want from you? That's what we are going to be talking about this very morning. And... And the question is, why are we looking at the requirement? Why are we looking at what is the requirement of Christianity? Why is it important for you to know what, to, to know what it takes to be a Christian? Why? The number one reason is because you can assess yourself whether you are a Christian or not. Okay? The number one reason why we are taking a look at the, why we are taking a look at the requirement of Christianity is for us to be able to do what is called a self-assessment. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse number 5, it says, Examine yourself whether you are in the faith. It says, Prove yourself. Know ye you not your own self, how the Lord Jesus Christ is in you, except you are a reprobate. In other words, he said that you as a believer, in order for you to continue to understand what is required of the Almighty God, say, assess yourself. Check yourself. Am I doing what God said I should do? Am I living the way he wants me to live? Am I doing exactly the things that he want me to do? But if you don't know the requirement of the Christian faith, how will you be able to make the assessment? If you don't know that this is what the Lord Almighty expects, those who are working with him, this is what he expects from them, how are you going to be able to assess whether you are doing it or you are not doing it? The Lord Almighty does not want you to guess whether you are serving him or not. He wants you to be very sure. The Bible says that the Lord knows, you know, he said those who serve the Almighty God, they know. You know whether you are whether you belong to him or if you don't belong to him. So the very first reason why you must know the requirement of the Christian faith is so that you can assess yourself. Number two reason is so that you can do a self-reflection. 
Self-reflection is that there is this thing that we used to say in the neck of the wood where I come from. They say if, two, if there is a lie, two people never suffer from a lie. The person who is telling the lie knows. If the person who is being told the lie does not know, the person who is telling it obviously knows. Okay? If I tell you that I have a house underwater in Nigeria, even if you have never been to Nigeria, you know that I know that I'm telling a lie. I don't have a house under the water. But the point I'm trying to make is that self-reflection is the reason why you must know the requirement of the Christian faith. So that you stop lying to yourself. Okay? We can all appear very good here. You might look very nice to me. You might know how to pray. Even speak in tongue here. Appear in church at the right time. Do what you are supposed to do. But the question is that, are you doing what the Lord Almighty wants you to do? In your own secret corner. I don't know. I'm not there. The only way you can assess yourself, the only way you can find out whether you are living in the faith, is to reflect. It's a do personal reflection on the requirement of the Almighty God. What is the Lord asking me to do? And am I doing it? Number three reason why we are doing this, why we, are, why we must understand the requirement of, uh, of the Christian faith is so that we can have what is called clear communication. Clear communication. Jesus Christ said in the book of Matthew chapter 9, in verse number 23, He said unto them, oh, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. These are the requirements. You deny yourself. You take up your cross, you follow the Almighty God. If you are not denying yourself, you are not taking up your cross, and you are not following the Almighty God, you know you are not meeting the requirements. It is a very clear communication. That's why you need to understand what the Lord God Almighty wants you to have. What He requires of you if you want to follow Him. Number four. Why is he, why are we studying this? Why are we looking at the requirement of the Christian faith? We are looking at it because you need to understand the expectation that the Lord has for you. What is the Lord expecting from you? Does he just want you to come? We sing too fast song, too slow song. We do our offering, collect the money, enjoy ourselves and go home. Is that what he's expecting? Is that the end of Christianity? Are we just supposed to come and just go like that and nothing changes in our life? The Bible says that he that is in Christ is a new creation. All things are passed away and all things have become new. If nothing has changed, there is a problem. The expectation is that anybody who walks with him must live a holy life. That is the expectation. So that is the reason why you must understand the requirement of the Christian faith. So that you can understand what the Lord is expecting from you, not me. Okay? It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter my own expectation. The most important expectation is the expectation of the Almighty God. What is the Lord expecting of you? You cannot meet the expectation of the Almighty God when you don't even know it in the first place. And that is why before you pass an exam, if you take a class, for those of us who are in school, when you are taking a class, they give you a syllabus. They tell you this is what you are expected to learn in this class. And at the end of the day, you are going to take a test. To test whether you understand, whether you meet the other, whether you meet the expectation, the understand the requirement for the Christian faith is given to us so that we can expect, we can understand the expectation of the Almighty God. And finally, finally, the reason why we do, the reason why we know why, why we must understand the Christian requirement is for us to have what is called proper accounting. Because at one point in time, you are going to give account, whether you like it or not. Okay. Whether we, no matter how long you live on this earth, you are going to die one day and you are going to give account. The Bible says, so then everyone shall, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. How are you going to give an account of, self, of yourself to the Almighty God when you don't know what the Lord Almighty is looking for? When you don't know the requirement, when you don't know the standard, when you don't know the things that the Lord is looking for in your life to be able to judge you. It is not a question of uh, if your good is bigger than your, your if your good is bigger than your evil, then you go into heaven. It doesn't work that way. The Lord already gave us the standard in the scripture, and that is why you must know the requirements. Now, these are just some of the reasons why it is important for you to know what it takes to be a Christian. But the question still remains: what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Let's look at the book of Luke, chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'll just give, give you a quick summary of the entire chapter and then we'll focus on certain verses of it. In Luke chapter 9, the Bible documents some of the activities of our Lord Jesus Christ. From verse 1 to verse number 6, the Bible talks about the power and the authority that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples and asked them to go and begin to heal the sick and to deliver the oppressed. By the time you get to verse number 7 through verse number 9, the Lord Almighty talks about a particular king, Herod the Tetrarch, who wanted to see the Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus was not really interested. Then if you go to verse number, 7, number 10, 
verse number 10 through verse number 16. That is where Luke documented the fact that Jesus Christ fed, fed 5,000 people. By the time you get to verse number 18 and 20, Jesus now talked to his disciple, asked his disciple, who do men say I am? That was the question we answered last week. Who do men say I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus Christ told him that flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. And by the time you now get to verse number 21 and 22, the Bible tells us that Jesus began to predict his own death and his own resurrection. What was going to happen? But by the time you now move to verse number 23, the Bible that Jesus now began to tell his disciples the costs of following him. And we'll pick up the story from verse number 23. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse number 23. Then he said unto them all, If anyone desire to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever desire to save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and lose himself and, 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 and himself and he and himself is destroyed or lost? For whosoever is ashamed of me and of my word, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in his own glory, and his fathers and of the angel and of his holy angel. By the time you fast forward to verse number 57 of Luke chapter 9, the Bible tells us that it happened. As they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And he said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the earth have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, to, but, but he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the gospel, uh, and preach the kingdom of God. Verse number 61. Now another, said unto, another said also, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Jesus said unto him, no one, having put his hands on the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now from this verse of scripture. I want you to observe some things about the Lord Jesus Christ, about this entire verse of scripture. What you will notice is this. The Lord Jesus Christ made an unusual request of all the people that were coming to him. Jesus was telling those who will follow him, he said, if you are going to follow me, if you are going to follow me, you have to know one thing. You have to learn how to deny yourself. In other words, your body will want something. Your people will want something. Those around you will want something. He said, but you must learn how to deny yourself and follow the dictate of the Almighty God. That was the first unusual request he made of those who are going to follow him. Number two request is that he gave, he had, he gave them an unusual responsibility. Is it not alone? It is not enough for you to deny yourself, Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, those who will follow me must take up their cross daily and follow him. In other words, there's going to be challenges. Anybody who tells you that you are following the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be bread and butter. Anybody who tells you as soon as you begin to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, life is going to be so beautiful for you. That person is preaching a fraudulent gospel. That person is preaching a fraudulent gospel. In the sense that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ did not promise you life of ease. He's going to take you through it if you have it. But he never told you he's going to take it. Away. He never told you that you will, you will be completely eliminated out of your life. He's saying, take up your cross daily and follow me. That was your usual responsibility. He's giving to anybody who will follow him. And then finally he said, there is an unusual expectation. And all unusual expectation is that he said that whosoever desire to save his life will lose it. And whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In other words, do not expect... That your life will be spared from the challenges of life. Do not expect that because you are following me, I am going to take away all the pains of life. I'm going to make sure that you have a pain-free life. No. He's saying that don't have that on you, don't have that expectation because it's not going to happen. You are going to go through life like a normal person. The difference between you and the people in the world is that I'm giving you a strength that is above. I'm giving you the grace that is above what the other people in the world will have. In other words, the Lord is saying it. The Lord is making it very clear that what is required of those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ is number one, to identify with Christ. He is spelling it out in a very clear language, the cost of discipleship. He's saying that those who follow me are going to pay a price. It is going to cost you something. You are not going to just walk in there and put your life on cruise control and that will be the end of the story. No. He's saying it's going to cost you something to walk with me. And you will think, this is the thing that was always fascinating me, to me about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Here is a guy who wants to preach the gospel to the whole world. Here is a guy who wants to bring everybody into the saving grace. Here is a guy who said that nobody should perish, but all will come to the saving grace. His mission is to make sure that nobody is lost. You will think that that guy will make it easy for everybody to follow him. Don't you think? I mean, you want everybody to be, to be saved. You want everybody to go to heaven. You should make it a lot easier for people to come in. That's what you will think. You will think that it will, uh, it will allow anybody who wants to follow him to come. That's what you will think. You will think that he will make discipleship easy. But no. Jesus Christ did not make it easy. He's even making it more difficult. He's telling his people, if you want... As much as I want everybody to be saved, as much as I want everybody to join me on this journey, it is not for everybody. That's what Jesus is saying. The fact that I have the door open, the fact that the invitation is given to everybody, it is not for everybody. Not everybody will come on this journey. Jesus is basically saying, as much as I want you to enjoy eternity with my Father, not everybody, some people are going to refuse because they don't want to pay the price. He said, as much as I want you, as I've invited you, as much as I've kept the door open, as much as I've given the invitation to everybody, very few will accept this invitation. That's what Jesus is saying. Because he's saying that, I am, don't, I don't, don't I want you to follow me, but not everybody will accept it. Jesus is basically saying that not everybody can tag along. There is a price to be paid. Not everybody will become a Christian. You can do multiple crusades and the whole stadium will be filled. Not everybody will be born again. Not because God does not want them to be born again. It's simply because some people have made the decision they don't want to. Some people have made the decision they don't like it. Some people have made the decision they don't want to pay the price. So Jesus is making us sure. He's making us understand that this thing is not everybody is not going to accept it. And the question is why? Why is Jesus telling them this particular thing up front? Ordinarily, if you want to encourage people to join you, you don't tell them the bad things. You want to sell them to them. You don't tell them that your car is going to break them after three years. You know, if you are buying a used car, you don't tell them by the time you drive out of this place, the car will start happening. You don't tell them that. You tell them how beautiful the car is. But Jesus was telling them the difficulty of following him. He was telling them the challenges of following him. Why did it appear that Jesus was more, Jesus more, more, was more like putting a roadblock on the way of those people who wanted to come? And the question is, why was Jesus so blunt about the cost of discipleship? Why was it Jesus telling people up front, this journey, before you take it, think twice. Before you follow me, think twice. You are not going to have a place to lay your head. You are not going to have this. You are not going to have that. You are even going to die. People are going to persecute you. Why? I mean, that's not a good way to motivate people. You know that. I mean, if I want to invite you to church, I say, well, if you are coming to this church, I'm going to make sure you stay here 24 hours every day. I'm going to make sure you wash the pastor's suit. I'm going to make sure you do all this. If I give you all that kind of condition, how many people will show up here? Everybody will disappear. But Jesus is giving them the condition. He's telling them, this is what to expect when you follow me. The question is, why is Jesus telling them? Why was Jesus being very upfront about the cost of discipleship? You see, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is upfront because he knew that this Christian journey is a difficult journey. Anybody who tells you otherwise is lying. It is, I've told you here before. It is very difficult for you to say, somebody slapped you on my right hand, I turned the other cheek. I hate where I grew up, we don't do that. They slap you on the left, you punch that person back. That's the way we do it. Now you are a Christian, somebody is telling you, slap the right, turn the left. No. Jesus is saying, when they take your coat, give everyone your shirt. No. I will find that person and take that person's coat, he said, and add it to my own. That's the way we do it. It is very difficult to live the Christian life. It is very difficult. That's why Jesus is telling them, don't expect this thing to be easy. You are going to fast. You are going to pray. There are times when you will pray and it will appear as if your prayer is not going beyond the ceiling. There are times when you are going to pray and it's going to look like God is not hearing. Don't misunderstand this journey. It is a difficult journey. That's why Jesus was telling them that. Number two, Jesus is telling them it's a costly journey. It's a very costly journey. There are some people, as soon as you become a Christian, some people stop talking to you. They don't want to associate themselves with you anymore. It's going to cost you your job sometimes. It's going to cost you promotion sometimes. It's going to cost you certain things. The life that other people are enjoying, you may not be able to enjoy. Jesus is saying, you need to know before you come. It's going to be a costly journey. It's not going to be an easy ride. 
And then he's going to tell them that it's also on a very dangerous journey. There are places in the earth right now. There are places in this world right now. Where if you mention the name of Jesus. is an express ticket for your head to be chopped off. Jesus is trying to let people know. That this is a dangerous journey. The fact that you associate yourself with me. You are going to be referred to as a, as a bigoted, bigoted individual. The fact that you associate yourself with me, it means that you are going to be opposed to some social conditions in this world. It means that you are going to be opposed, opposed to some of the things that our politicians are pushing. And as soon as you take a stand, people will see you and they will say that, yes, you are not, they will want to destroy your work, destroy your means of livelihood. Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you need to know that it's a dangerous journey. You might lose your life. You might lose your income. You might lose your friends. You might lose your career. You might lose everything that pertains unto you. So Jesus is saying, count the cost before you take on this journey. Before you sign the dotted line. Know what you are getting yourself into. That's what Jesus is saying. That is why it appears as if Jesus is putting a roadblock. That's why it appears he was very upfront with the question. With the, with the, with the challenges of following him. And the question is, what, you know, what is it about this Christian faith that makes it very difficult? What is it about this Christian faith that makes it extremely difficult? Why is it that it's very costly for you to be a Christian? Why is it difficult for people to obey or to follow the requirement of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why? Let me suggest to you, read chapter, uh, let's read the book of John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Reading from verse number 6, the Bible tells us, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Say, no man comes up to the Father except through me. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the following the Lord Jesus Christ is difficult because number one, it is a very, very narrow way. Very narrow way. The Bible said there are two ways. There is one way that is very narrow and that only few people can, drive, can walk in it. He said there is another way that is very broad that a lot of people are rushing into it. Christianity is difficult because it is narrowly defined. That's number one. Number two, Christianity is difficult because it is very, very exclusive. It does not include everything. Not everybody, Christianity does not tolerate everything. It's either you believe in Christ or you don't. It's either you are holy or you are not. It's either you are obeying or you are not obeying. It's either you are pure or you are filled. It. It's a very, very exclusive religion. That's why it's difficult. It is difficult because it requires a definite experience. Bible makes us to understand that he who is in Christ is a new creation. In other words, there has to be a transformation that takes place in your life. If that transformation has not happened, you can call yourself whatever you want, but you are not yet born again. You are not yet on the journey. It requires a definite experience. God must do something inside your spirit that changes you and turns you to a new person. That is why Christianity is difficult, because you can't fake it. You can't fake it. The difficulty of the Christian faith is that a lot of people can say, yeah, you can, you can subscribe to a religion you don't even believe in. But you cannot be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ except something has happened inside your heart. If there has been no change inside your spirit, you can praise God, hallelujah, all you want. You have not started the journey. That is why Christianity is difficult. Christianity is difficult because of the power of sin. Every other religion is trying to take away sin. But Jesus Christ is the only one that has taken away sin. They all try to cover sin. They all try to make sure they manipulate the, the human experience. But it is the only law. It's only in the Christian faith that the issue of sin is dealt with once and for all. That's why Christianity is difficult. Because the power of sin has to be taken away by the blood of Jesus. And finally, Christianity is difficult because of the determination of the devil. The devil is determined to take as many people to hell as possible. The devil is determined to be able to destroy as many lives as possible. And he's doing it every day. By the lies that he tells them. By the things that they engage themselves in. And the Lord is saying, if you are going to follow me, you have to release yourself unto me. And because we have difficulty releasing and we continue to fight the enemy, that is why it's difficult for people to follow God. The determination of hell. To make sure that we do not arrive at the gate of at the gate of glory, that is why Christianity is difficult. In other words, 
Following Christ is difficult because it's a way of life that you have to adopt. It's a way of life that you have to adopt. There is a way you were living before. And now that you are a Christian, your life must change. Something must be different. You cannot continue to live the same way that you have been living and say that you are a believer. Something is missing. And you have heard me say it several times here. If somebody has met the Lord Jesus Christ, says they met the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing changed in their life, two possibilities. It's either you have not met Jesus or you met the wrong one. Because if you meet the right Jesus, something will change in your life. Something will change in your life. It will turn your life around. And they will have the testimonies of millions of people who have been born again. So the idea here is that it is difficult to follow Christ because it's a way of life. Okay? It is difficult because it's a lifestyle that you have to adopt. Following Christ is difficult because it's just the way that we see the world. It changes the way you see everything. You're no longer seeing the world the way like every other person sees the world again. You don't relate to the world the same way anymore. You don't behave the same way anymore. You don't talk the same way anymore. You don't see things the same way anymore. It changes everything about you. That's why it's difficult. And unless it happens on the inside, my brother, you can't fake it. There's no way you can manipulate it. Okay? And that is why it is difficult. That is why the gospel message is not popular. That is why a lot of people find it difficult to associate with the Almighty God. The question then is, uh, for those who want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, what is Jesus requiring from them? What is the Lord Jesus Christ asking them? What is the Lord Jesus Christ saying that they must do in order to follow him? Let's go back to the book of Matthew and Luke chapter 9. Reading from verse number 57. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 57. The Bible tells us, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Forces have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay. He said, verse number 59, Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go. Let me first go and bury let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said also, Lord, I will follow you, but let me go first and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no one having put his hands on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now from this verse of the scripture, what is the Lord asking you? What is he asking me? Those of us who are making up our mind to walk with the Almighty God, what is the Lord asking us? Number one is asking you to count the costs. Don't just sign up to say, I want to be a Christian. Don't just sign up to say, I want to follow God. He said, count the cost. Know what it means to follow him. Know how much it's going to cost you. The friendship is going to cost you. The jobs or the relationship is going to cost you. Even the lifestyle change that is going to cost you. He said, count the costs. That's what it takes. Number two. What does it take? He said, define your priorities right. Define your priorities right. Jesus Christ, the man said, let me first go and bury my dead. And Jesus Christ said, let the dead bury their dead. In other words, define your priority. Do you want to serve God or do you want to serve the devil? Do you want to be in this camp or do you want to do your own thing? I used to joke and tell people that there are many, there are different kinds of Christian. You have the 12 o'clock Christian that are fully dedicated to the almighty God. You have the 3 o'clock Christians who are not sure whether to go to heaven or they are going to hell. Then you have the 6 o'clock Christians who's one out. They are praising God on Sunday and they are going to, and they are doing their disco thing on Friday. So they are the 6 o'clock Christian. So there are so many kinds of Christians. And the Lord is saying, define your priority. Do you want to follow me or do you want to do your own thing? That's why Jesus Christ said that you cannot serve two masters. Okay? It's either you are serving God or you are serving the devil. You can't serve the two of them together. It doesn't work like that. Number three, what is the Lord Jesus Christ asking? Jesus is asking them, he said, be single in your focus. In other words, stay focused. If you want to follow me, follow me. If you are doing what you want to do, do what, you know, follow me. For most of us who know how to drive here, you know it is very difficult for you to drive and keep on looking at the rear view mirror. You are going to crash yourself. And that's what happened to a lot of Christians. They want to follow God, but the same that they keep looking back. They keep trying to understand what is going on in the world. They still want to be popular in the world. They still want to be respected in the world. They still want to be called the special guy in the world. They still want to maintain all their old friends, all the old girlfriends and boyfriends, all the other things. that They still want to maintain everything that they've had in the past. They don't want to make any change. Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, I need you to be single focus. Not only that, he said, I need your settled commitments. Are you doing this or are you doing something else? 
I need a settled commitment from you. That's what Jesus is saying. And finally, say, I need total surrender. I am not going to take any other thing. I don't want to be number two in your life. I want to be number one. Can you imagine when you're married to somebody? And then that person, you say, okay, you are my husband, I'm your wife, or it's all that. You, are, you are my wife, I'm your husband, or whichever way it goes. And then that person says, well, no problem, now that we are married, I hope you can sign the deal, I'll have another three or four wives somewhere else. As much as we know someone is part of our culture somewhere in the world, but you find that it's not very easy on the individual. You need a total commitment from that individual, we need total surrender. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. Except I am number one in your life, I'm not, I don't want to occupy any position. So if you are going to follow him, Jesus is requiring and is demanding for total surrender. And that is why he said that, uh, I want to follow you, but let me go first and first say farewell to those who are by my house. Jesus said, no one having put his hands on the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom. You have to be totally surrendered, totally dedicated. Now for those of us who are living in this, 20, in this, uh, in this, in this current time, in this day and age, the words of Jesus appear to be very insensitive, don't you think? His requirements appear to be harsh and, and, and extreme. Can you imagine? Let's just take for a second. Keep the Bible aside. Let's imagine for a second. One of you comes to me and says, Pastor, okay, I just lost my house. My family is about to be homeless. Okay? And uh, we, are not going, we don't have a place to rest our head today. And then I say to that person, Foxes have holes, birds have nests, the son of man has no place to lay his head. In other words, get over it. You will say, okay, is that how you counsel your people? And then another person comes and say, pastor, I just lost a family member. I will not be able to come to church for the next three weeks. And then I say, well, let the dead bury their dead. You come to church and serve the church. I need somebody to clean the table. I need somebody to put the chairs right. You will look at me and say, something is wrong with this African man. And you will make sure that everybody in this community knows that something is wrong with me. Because you will, number one, you will think that I'm a very selfish human being. You will consider me to be very insensitive. Because you have just told me that you lost your parent or you lost a family member. And I'm telling you that what is important is for you to come and clean the church. That you have to serve God. Let the dead go and let the dead go and bury their dead. If I say that to anybody here right now, I can assure you that next Sunday I'm only going to be talking to myself. <laughs> because my, my wife, I'll be talking to my wife because my wife will try at least would be nice to me. Will, but the point I'm making is that it is not that is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying. And if you look, you know, he wanted you. He, he is here is a guy who was asking what people were telling what appeared to be legitimate, and he was telling them something. That, the question is, was our Lord Jesus Christ a jerk? Was this somebody who was, who was uh, what do you call it, who was insensitive? Was this somebody who did not care for the welfare of people who were coming to him? Of course not. But you will begin to understand that Jesus Christ took that position. He took that position because he knew or understand the mission that he came to accomplish on earth. He took that position because he understood the position and the opposition of hell towards what he was about to do. And he understood that and he understood that unless the people are committed, they will not be able to fulfill the Great Commission. He knew that. He knew that unless the people are, you know, are willing, they will not be able to pay the price of salvation. And that is why Jesus Christ said, I don't want people who are reluctant. Jesus said, I don't want people who are, who are not committed. That's why Jesus Christ said, I don't want people who are half-hearted. People who just want to enjoy the benefit of the gospel. I don't want those people. I want the people who are sold out. I want the people who are not half-hearted wannabes. I want people who do not have a broken focus. I want people who are not in there for their selfish ambition. I want people who are sold out. That's the people that I want. That's why Jesus made this kind of statement. So that he can weed out all the people who are not serious about this journey. So that he can weed out the people who are only looking for what they want to eat. Who are going to weed out the people who are just interested in the show, but they are not interested in the word of God. The question then is that, who is the man, who is the woman, who can do what? Who can fulfill the demands of the almighty God to follow him? Who is that man? Who can meet the demand of following the almighty God? Number one, the man who, and the woman who can meet this particular demand is a man who is willing to go through repentance and transformation. 
Because the Bible says all have sinned and have come short of the glory of the Almighty God. That person who will be able to obey, who will be able to follow and fulfill the command, the, uh, fulfill the requirement of following the Almighty God, that person must go through the experience of repentance and transformation. Number two, he must go through the experience of surrendering and sacrifice. Because if you don't surrender yourself to the Almighty God and you keep struggling with it, you will never get anything done from him. Number three, must be a man who understands the word of God and is willing to communicate with the Almighty God. A man who knows how to study the scripture. A man who understands how to pray. The one who knows how to seek his faith. That is the person who can fulfill the requirement of the Almighty God. Number four, is a person who is willing to walk with the Almighty God in faith and in obedience. The Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. And anybody who will fulfill the requirement of walking with the Almighty God, that individual must be willing to walk in faith and total obedience to the Word of God. That person must also be willing to walk in the area of holiness and righteousness, purity within and without. That is the person who can fulfill the, fulfill the requirement of following the Almighty God. And finally, that person must also be a person who is interested in fellowship and ministry. Fellowship means that fellowship in one another, interact with one another, talk to one another, enjoy the company of one another, and at the same time, be involved in ministry that is extending the word of God to other people. These are just some of the demands that the Almighty God places upon the people who want to follow him. The question is, do you know what it takes to work with the Almighty God? Because you cannot fulfill the requirement of the kingdom unless you know it. So the question is, do you know what it takes to follow the Almighty God? And are you willing to pay the price of following him. Are you willing to pay the price of obedience? Are you willing to pay the price of righteousness? Are you willing to pay the price of repentance? Are you willing to pay the price of transformation? Are you willing to pay the price of prayer? The price of the study of the word of God? The price of faith? The price of obedience? The price of holiness and righteousness? Are you willing to pay the price of fellowship? That's the question that the Lord is posing unto us. Are you willing to pay the price of following the almighty God? 